No, 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 no. <sighs> sir, sir, an army headed this way. Spartans! Damn. What are we gonna do? There's only one thing we can do. We must create a core of crack troops comprised entirely of male lovers. Sir? <laughs> That's right, the Sacred Band of Thebes was a crack corps of hardened super-soldiers comprised entirely of gay male lovers. And although that might sound like, well, a kind of a wacky idea to us today, it didn't in ancient Greece. In fact, to many philosophers of the day, it sounded perfectly rational. After all, the most devastating force on the battlefield was fear, and who would dare give in to fear in front of their lover? makes a certain kind of sense. Lovers, they reasoned, would spur each other on to greater and greater glory on the battlefield. So goes the argument, which you could call the original gaze in the military debate. But theory is one thing, practice quite another. So how did it actually work out? Well, pretty damn well, actually. And here to tell us all about it is classicist James Rom, whose new book, The Sacred Band, 300 Theban Lovers Fighting to Save Greek Freedom, comes out tomorrow. In it, you'll find the entire story of the struggle of Thebes against Sparta, the rise of the Sacred Band, and ultimately its demise at the hands of Alexander the Great. Today, we're going to focus specifically on these OG gays in the military to discover why the band was formed, how it functioned, and what its lasting legacy is. That's what we're talking about in today's interview. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the History of Sex. History of Sex is sponsored by Dr. Jillian Kenny, historian of women, sex, and magic in medieval Europe. Hey folks, it's Pride Month, and while many of you are marching in the streets this month, you can think of those who have marched before you, way before you, not in the street, but on the battlefield. Today, we're marching alongside the Sacred Band of Thebes with author James Rom. James Rom is an author, reviewer, and James H. Ottaway Jr. Professor of Classics at Bard College in Annandale, New York. He specializes in ancient Greek and Roman culture and civilization. His reviews and essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, The London Review of Books, The Daily Beast, and other venues. He is the author of Ghost on the Throne, The Death of Alexander the Great, and The War for Crown and Empire. And his latest book, which releases tomorrow, just in time for Pride, is the sacred band, 300 Theban Lovers Fighting to Save Greek Freedom. All right, so first of all, thank you so much for being here, James. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So before we talk about the sacred band itself, we should just start off with getting a clear, like firm context of what same-sex love for men was like in ancient Greece, especially in different parts of ancient Greece. Because, you know, for most of us who aren't award-winning classicists, <laughs> we tend to think of ancient Greece as a fairly homogenous culture, but it was anything but. And as you note in your book also, as much as we would like to believe, especially during Pride Month, homosexuality, you know, same-sex love was not just fully accepted in ancient Greece. It was, as Plato writes, complicated <laughs> in many parts of ancient Greece. So can you give us just a super brief crash course in male same-sex love in Athens and Sparta, for example, versus how it was in Thebes, where the sacred band would be formed? Well, yes, you use the word complicated that uh, I quoted from Plato's Symposium, uh, which is the fullest description we have of same-sex love among males in Athens. And it's a very idealized picture, but um, generally the picture there is one of older men, whom the Greeks called erastai, mm -hmm. lovers, mm -hmm. 
courting and uh, forming relationships with younger males, sometimes prepubescent or just entering puberty, uh, whom the Greeks called eromanoi. Mm -hmm. And the term that's often used for that model is pederasty. It's mm -hmm. not a term that I like because it has negative valence in the modern world. Uh, for the Athenians, it seemed to be uh, totally accepted and not stigmatized. Um, but usually transitory relationships that mm -hmm. ended after the young man matured. Meaning that would be like, what, when they're like 21? Or is it more like when they got mustache growing? Or Yes, when they started to grow facial hair, when they became fully mature mm -hmm. physically. The ideal age for the Aromanos was thought to be at the point where the mustache was first coming in. Mm -hmm. The Greeks had a word, who paintes, a mustacher for a youth at that <laughs> stage. Um, of course, that's very young for our society. Mm -hmm. But then again, heterosexual marriages were being formed with girls as young as 13 or 12. Mm -hmm. So the idea of, um, you know, age of consent was mm -hmm. not, had not been formed yet. So that's Athens. But even in Athens, we hear of prejudice against homosexual relationships or Aristophanes, the comic poet, makes fun of them. So attitudes seem to have varied widely. Mm -hmm. Plato seems to accept them as ideal, natural, but transitory. Mm -hmm. In Thebes, by contrast, these relationships seem to have had more permanence and to have persisted really lifelong. Okay. So a commitment could be made by the Erastes and the Romanos, uh, a vow of eternal fidelity, much like a marriage. And the word that Xenophon uses of these relationships is one that normally applies to marriage. So uh, relationships seem to have had more permanence and more stability and to have been part of adult life for both partners. Okay. And in Thebes, does that seem like that was how it was, you know, since time immemorial, quote unquote, in Thebes? Or was that something new during this period that gave rise to the sacred band? It seems to have gone way back. We hear of a lawgiver named Philo Laus, who came to Thebes from Corinth with his Aromanos, with his beloved, who was already a mature male, who was an Olympic victor. Mm -hmm. And the two of them had such commitment to one another that they had themselves buried side by side so that they would be forever, forever together. And Philolaus was described as a lawgiver for Thebes who supported homosexual relationships in his legislation. Okay. Giving, giving a special privilege to those bonds. So Thebes was unique, I think, in the ancient world. Sure. And that would have been well before the period we're about to talk about. This is more like in the early days of Thebes. Yes, this is a couple of centuries back. Right? Okay. Gotcha. And also, I was curious, in Thebes, is there also an age differential like there was in Athens? Or was it like equal age? Or could it be any age for Theban lovers? I think there's always some age differential, but it might be very small. Mm-hmm. There was always an Erastes and an Romanos, a lover and a beloved, some asymmetry, whether it's age, whether one was bearded and the other not, one was of higher social rank than the other. Asymmetry was thought to be essential to these relationships. Huh. A pairing of two equal males of equal age and stature was unnatural. Gotcha. Okay, so they even in Thebes, they did think about it in those two terms like they still broke it up between those two older and younger yes terms. okay interesting yes all the greeks did sparta had two different terms for the lover and the beloved but again there was an asymmetry that was assumed interesting and then so we're mostly going to be talking about male same-sex love today because our main topic is the sacred band of thebes which was all male lovers but i'm just curious what was the situation for female same-sex lovers in ancient greece well, we don't know a lot about that. Okay. Um, women get far less attention generally. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this arena, there's hardly any evidence. 
But um, we do have the poetry of Sappho, mm -hmm. which includes what seems to be erotic love poetry directed at younger women mm -hmm. in her circle. And of course, Sappho came from the island of Lesbos. So in the 19th century, when the British and other European cultures were first discovering or acknowledging the existence of homosexual love, the term lesbian was coined mm -hmm. from the poetry of Sappho. Lesbian meaning from Lesbos. Right. Uh, okay, excellent. So let's now transition into our main topic, which is talking about the sacred band of thieves, which is also the main topic of your book. So to have a tradition in Thebes of lifelong male love, that's that's one thing. But then to take that tradition and draw from it to form a military corps of crack troops, you know, that that's quite another thing entirely. So What's up with that? I mean, why was this band formed entirely of male lovers? So Thebes had a unique need for military defense. They had retaken their city from an, a Spartan occupation that was very cruel and oppressive. And the Spartans at this time were led by a very aggressive, warlike king. And the Thebans knew that they would have to pay a price for mm -hmm. their reconquest. And so they formed the Sacred Band as part of their military strategy to fend off the Spartan counterblow. They seem to have recognized that uh, no force could motivate men in battle better than the desire to shine in the eyes of the beloved. That, that was the greatest human motivator. Plato speaks of it in the Symposium mm -hmm. and says, speaking hypothetically, that an army composed of male lovers would defeat any foe. It's possible that he was referring to the sacred band because the symposium was written at right about the same time, but we can't know for certain. Mm -hmm. But um, in any case, that was deemed to be a, a more powerful force for inspiring courage than patriotism or fighting for pay or any of the other incentives that one might give. Interesting. And that really speaks volumes for the different attitude that that culture and themes must have had compared to today. Because if I imagine, you know, military commanders sitting around, a, you know, a tent and a bunch of maps today, and somebody suggests that at best, you might have somebody say like, well, that's so crazy, it just might work. But, you know, this, this seems to be something that was given full credence in, and not really... Um, deemed as like, oh, that that's a pretty wild out there fringe idea. They were like, yeah, we're under serious threat. What are we going to do about it? They come up with this idea. They're like, let's do it. And there was precedence for it in mythology, the pairing of Achilles and Patroclus in the Iliad, which the Greeks assumed was a homoerotic pairing. Hmm. Achilles and Patroclus were assumed to be lovers. Mm-hmm. And it was the death of Patroclus that brought Achilles back to the battlefield and inspired him to kill Hector. Mm -hmm. And you have other pairs of heroes, Heracles or Hercules and Iolaus, who were native to Thebes, that fought together like Batman and Robin <laughs> and uh, were invincible because mm -hmm. of their, the tightness of their bond. Tell them, Robin. Holy surprises, Batman! <laughs> So uh, there, it wasn't totally original idea. It didn't come ex nihilo. Mm -hmm. The Greeks had had these ideas in their mythic traditions. So I've got so many questions <laughs> for you about how this actually would have worked, like actually in the field. Um, I don't know if as historians we even know the answers to these things. So if we don't know, just say so. But here are the things that are floating through my mind. So I'll just rattle them off. First of all, is it enough to just be like you're attracted to other men or do you have to actually take a lover to be part of this band? Secondly, like if that's the case, the second one there, do you have to be lovers before you join? Are you assigned a lover when you join? Like how does all that work? And what if you break up or one dies? And lastly, what about jealousy? I mean, that could be as big of a force as this loyalty, you know, to your lover and wanting to impress them. So 
how did this work? <laughs> These are all imponderable questions because we don't have any mm. detailed information about what went on inside the band. It's funny you mentioned breakups because a uh, classical scholar who doesn't believe the legend of the sacred band mm. said that it couldn't possibly have worked because what happens if you break up? So mm. uh, there is room for a, a small amount of doubt mm -hmm. as to whether this is all fiction or not. Mm. Most scholars believe it to be fact. Um, the um, My assumption is that the couples were already established when they were recruited. We know mm -hmm. that at Thebes, men pledged allegiance to one another and that the older male would give armor to the younger male as a sort of rite of initiation into adulthood, give him a set of mm -hmm. military armor. So there was a sort of a martial foundation Okay. to the uh, homosexual bond. So assuming that the couples were pledged and they already had a tradition of military excellence, it would be natural to recruit them as couples and station them side by side. I think that's an important point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, the, the Batman and Robin analogy comes to mind that it's important <laughs> that we see that, that these two males were side by side. Plutarch, who writes gives us the most information we have about the band, compares them to two chariot horses. Mm -hmm. And he claims that chariots run faster than single horses. I don't know if that's true, but he assumed it to be true because the two horses vie with one another. And that spurs mm -hmm. them both on to run faster than a single horse. So mm -hmm. it was essential that they be stationed side by side. Yeah, very interesting. And also, uh, it seems key to the fact that how they were articulating this in terms of you would not want to be shamed in front of your lover by, say, like dropping your arms and, you know, hightailing it off the field. Exactly. So to have them in, like in eyesight of each other, even right next to each other would be crucial. Yes. And Xenophon, who is our other source for the band and for this whole period, um, turns that on his head and claims that the reason they're side by side is that both of them want to desert and they're keeping an eye on each other. So Xenophon, who had a hatred of the Thebans and a touch of homophobia to boot, um, mm -hmm. uh, makes this a very negative feature of the Theban culture. They had to sure. put lovers side by side because either one of them would run away given the opportunity. <laughs> Just another reminder that uh, there were diverse views in ancient Greece. Exactly, yes. yes. And yeah. reading Xenophon against Plato is fascinating. Both of them wrote symposiums. Mm -hmm. They both wrote work called the Symposium. Plato's is exclusively homosexual, and Xenophon's is very heterosexual and demonizes the idea of male sex, male-on-male -male sex, and says that the, the Spartans considered it as bad as incest. Hmm. So the Spartans did. The Spartans. So you get these two diametrically opposed views in the same era in works by the same title. You mentioned uh, Achilles and Patroclus just a moment ago. Um, and that reminds me of another aspect that might prove vital to the psychology of this military tactic here, which is um, I recall from reading the Iliad, the story of the Trojan War from Homer, uh, you know, these vivid scenes of like one soldier would go down and then there would, be, there would be this whole sort of like mini battle about defending the body of the fallen soldier against all like enemies so that the body would not be defiled by the enemy. And how much more would you be committed to that if it was the body of your dear lover? So I wonder if that played into the psychology as well, or if maybe that was just a literary trope. I don't know to what extent it's accurate to how an actual battle would have gone in ancient Greece, but it's an interesting form of psychology that might be at play. Yes, very much so. And recovery of bodies was still a huge feature of warfare in the classical age, not just in the, in the Iliad. So a Greek infantry battle would end and one side would admit defeat by 
requesting a truth to recover the bodies. Mm. You had to be um, in possession of the bodies, and that required you to ask the victors for a truce. So that was like a formal admission of defeat. So next I want to I want to keep going with how did these how did this work out on the actual battlefield but I want to switch now to like how were these troops deployed in war because on the one hand I could imagine you know having a special crack corps that have this like very cultural theme to it we're Thebans we form lifelong bonds between men so we're going to have this special corps that's like it's almost like our our flagship or like our symbols of of our pride as Thebans, but not necessarily that they were like the best fighters among the Thebans or our crack troops. But reading the sources about these and reading your book, it does sound like they were actually uh, used as crack troops, like very effective, devastating fighters on the battlefield. Uh, So what can you tell me about, about that? Like, were they actually as effective? Very much so. They were trained year-round by the city, kept at public expense, and drilled, which is uncommon in the Greek world. Only the Spartans up till this point had conducted year-round training exercises, kept its army in Mm -hmm. service throughout the year. Other cities would just field troops as needed, and then everyone goes back to their farms. The, The Thebans drilled the band so that they would be at peak readiness and then kept them together as a cohesive unit and put them in the front and had them charge at a concentrated point of the enemy line, what um, we now call cutting off the snake's head. And that term actually dates to the glory days of Thebes. The leader of the sacred band coined it by holding up a snake and crushing its head and showing the army that the (laughs) snake then became lifeless. So you think of the phalanx line, which is a long Mm -hmm. line of soldiers as a spearman of of infantrymen Mm -hmm. as a snake, as a long, you know, sinuous line. um, The goal of the sacred band was to attack the strong point where the leadership was, which was Mm -hmm. usually meant the Spartan king and knock that person and that unit out. And then the rest of the line becomes useless. Interesting. Yeah. And I do remember reading about that tactic in particular in your book. Correct me if I get this a little bit off, but as I, as I recall, it was more the custom to place your strong troops on, I forget it was the right or the left, but because both sides would be doing that, the strong troops would not be fighting the strong troops. But then the Theban band was placed on the opposite end so that you had strong against strong. Is that is that right? Or... Exactly. Yes, that was the innovation of Epaminondas, the leader of Thebes during this period, and the one of the architects of the sacred band, to put his strongest troops on the left, mm-hmm. breaking with Greek tradition, which always had them on the right, so that they would be facing the enemy's right and their strongest troops. So to match strength against strength rather than strength against weakness. And that proved to be the winning formula at the Battle of Leuctra, which was the greatest battle of of the day of really most of Greek history, one one of the most essential battles of Greek history. Essential because why? Because the Spartans were defeated in open battle for the first time Mm -hmm. ever. The Spartans had lived on their reputation for uh decades by the time the sacred band came along they've been growing gradually weaker and had diminishing population but their reputation for invincibility was so strong that Mm -hmm. very few enemies were willing to face them epaminondas and the sacred band defeated them in an open battle in a devastating fashion knocking out their king killing their king and several of their top officials with the first strike and that demolished the reputation for invincibility. Wow. Yeah. So 
especially after movies like 300, we think of, you know, the Spartans as being the most badass of all in ancient Greece. And then who takes them out but this band of sacred thieves? Yes, the first, exactly. The first ones to do so. Exactly. In their entire history, for hundreds of years, Spartans have been regarded as supermen, like in mm -hmm. Zack Snyder's movie. Uh, this is Sparta. This is Sparta! That was all you had to say, <laughs> and your enemies quaked. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, once they were defeated, it was all, the bubble popped. It was mm -hmm. no longer possible to maintain this mirage. Mm -hmm. So that leads me into another interesting aspect, is once this illusion is, as you say, the bubble is popped, right? And all of Greece around them can see that hey, Spartans aren't all, uh, all cracked up to what we thought they were. W why wasn't this this sacred band copied more widely by other Greek cities? I mean, uh, or was it? It does seem to have been copied by a city called Elis. Okay. Xenophon tells us that they also had a band of 300 with lovers stationed side by side. We don't know if they called it the sacred band, but they seem to have developed the same model. And later we hear of a Carthaginian sacred band in a, in a non-Greek society. Oh, really? Uh, but we don't know what its composition was. We only know they called it the sacred band. Ah. Um, in terms of why it didn't spread more widely, well, Thebes, as I mentioned, had this unique model of male relationships, mm. lifelong, stable male relationships, and other cities really didn't. And Elis, by the way, is, is another city which was said to also have that model. And they were also the other sacred band of, the, of this era. So it seems to have been a result of the, um, the uh, social construct of, the, of those two cities. Let me ask a, a little more about the standing army aspect you mentioned just a second ago. So you mentioned that it wasn't just that the sacred band was composed of all male lovers. The other thing that made them unique was that they were a standing army apart from Sparta's standing army. And so they were drilled constantly. So they were in top shape. They were uh, working together well as a unit, but also over time, over many years, you get that, um, I forget the term for it in military uh, terminology, but it's like you keep the command knowledge passing on from one unit to the next unit to the next unit without it with an unbroken line mm -hmm. institutional memory was the term i was looking for so I, I can only imagine how much that would have played into this and i wonder pure speculation i wonder what the situation was like for theban males who were attracted to other males in terms of like were they heading a household as well? Was there some reason why they made better standing army soldiers than Thebans who are attracted mainly to women? That's a good question. Um, and we don't know, uh, I should make clear, we don't know whether these relationships were exclusive. Right. They could have been bisexual. They could have been bisexual. They could have yeah. also had wives and children. In fact, there's some mm -hmm. indication that they did. Although Epaminondas himself is known to have had uh, two Eromanoi um, beloveds and no wife. So mm -hmm. for him, it seems to have been, you know, he was exclusively homosexual. But um, the others perhaps also had wives. It's hard to know. Uh, that was certainly true at Athens. Mm -hmm. Having a male lover was not, did not contradict the idea of marriage and children. But in terms of their status as a standing army, they were kept at public expense. Very few cities mm -hmm. did this. It was just thought to be the role of the private individual to mm -hmm. maintain his own set of armor, to come up for the draft when called, but otherwise live a private life, train only for a week or two before going into battle. Mm -hmm. So um, Sparta, of course, had developed a system of universal, lifelong military training. And so Thebes sort of adapted that idea with this one small unit. And it also reminds me that in 
probably more in Athens, but in parts of ancient Greece, being kept at public expense was in many cases a great honor. So for example, I'm thinking of champions at the Olympic Games or the various similar games that were held in ancient Greece, the victor, one of the benefits um, was that I if I'm recalling correctly, we would be fed at public expense thereafter. Yes. Olympic so, victors uh, were kept in the Prytaneion, the uh, uh, Senate chamber, uh, mm -hmm. and given uh, meals at state expense for a year. For a year. For so, a year. A great honor to be able to have that. And it wasn't like they had these welfare states that were just doling out things left and right to the public back then. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes, it was. There was no public treasury for these kind of right. things. It yeah. wasn't like today where the government had a huge role in maintaining the military. Mm -hmm. It simply organized the citizens into a militia. We would call them a militia rather than an army. Sure. All right, so that gives us a pretty good picture of like what it was like for uh, these males in the sacred band and what their context was. So now let's talk about, in the end, how it turned out for them. So we saw that they were instrumental in the first ever great defeat of the big, bad, mighty Spartans. They may have been copied by at least one other city, as you mentioned, um, in the end, the sacred band didn't last, though. I mean, it, it, it didn't didn't carry on um, past Thebes, as far as I understand. Um, so I'm curious, first of all, how did it end? And secondly, why wasn't it just reformed um, when they met their demise? So the last part of my book deals with the era of Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. who rose to power at a time when Thebes was still very strong, but was waning because its its leadership had all passed on, had all been killed in battles, and there was not a secondary level of leadership. Um, Alexander became more and more powerful. His father, Philip, became more and more powerful, and the Thebans allied with the Athenians to try to stop Philip and Alexander. Mm -hmm leading to the enormous battle called Chaeronea in northern Greece. And at that battle, Alexander cut off the sacred band from the rest of their line and annihilated them to a man. All 300 were killed on the spot, and that was the end of the unit. Three years after Thebes itself was destroyed by Alexander, raised to the ground, and its entire population either killed or sold into slavery. So the rise of Alexander led to the fall of Thebes and the destruction of the sacred band because they represented the strength of Greek opposition. He made an mm -hmm. example of Thebes and the band to show the Greeks that there would be no resistance to Macedonian rule. Interesting. So in a certain sense, in the way that the bubble was popped for Sparta, this popped the bubble perhaps for Thebes and the sacred band, where now Philip and Alexander are making a point of saying, like, we've got something even better. Exactly. And, and there will be no resistance. I compare it to the bombing of Hiroshima, mm. uh, which, of course, is a very controversial event. But uh, I think everyone would agree that it was a demonstration to the world that there would be no messing with United States power. We were going to set the agenda for the coming world order. And mm. Macedon was saying much the same thing to the Greeks by the destruction of the sacred band. So to the rest of Greece, do you feel that the sacred band was that important, that it could serve as that symbolic message? Exactly. It had enormous mm. symbolic importance. And Alexander seems to have quite deliberately 
cut them off and, and mowed them down. And then they were buried in a most remarkable fashion. And part of the illustration program of my book are the drawings made in 1880 when the mass grave of the sacred band was exhumed. Mm -hmm. uh, they were buried in phalanx formation, in rows as though they were standing together in battle. Only 254 skeletons were found. The others perhaps are beyond the perimeter of the excavation, but certainly the whole sacred band was buried together in phalanx formation. And then the Lion of Karenea, a remarkable monument, a very mournful statue, was set above them as a memorial to their valor and to their demise. Tell me a little bit about what we know, at least, from the sources of the courage on that day when they're facing down Philip and Alexander, facing their demise. Do we know, like, was it a case where, yeah, they might have run, but they were completely cut off and couldn't? And and then it was it was like the Macedonians' choice to mow them down to the last man? Or did they make a point of themselves standing uh, their ground and being willing to die to the last man. That's hard to know because the descriptions of the battle are, are very sparse, but mm. the excavation of the tomb shows that many of them had multiple wounds, any of which would have disabled mm. an ordinary person. You know, there was a fracture to the skull and the leg and hack marks on the arms and then finally, they were killed by a pike blade that was left in the rib cage. So mm -hmm. it seems that these guys fought on despite being battered and bashed from all sides. They probably chose to stand and die just the way the 300 did at Thermopylae in the mm -hmm. Zack Snyder movie. And yet... The, that wasn't like anything that was like the norm in ancient Greece. I mean, you do have these two examples of dying to the last man, but that was very much the exception for battles in ancient Greece, right? Yes. Most units, if they were surrounded, cut off, clearly outnumbered, would either drop their shields and run or mm -hmm. surrender and ask for quarter. Mm -hmm. It was um, unique to the... Spartans of the Thermopylae battle and to these sacred band soldiers that they chose to just fight it out to the last. Alexander may not have given them any choice. It's possible that they asked for quarter and were denied. So mm -hmm. that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to choose <laughs> to believe that they showed their courage on that day. So I wanted to uh, sort of like wrap up in a neat little bow what I kind of started asking uh, earlier, which was, so they're slaughtered to the last man. Why wasn't this reformed? So we, we got this. It's it's definitely a, a symbolic message to the rest of Greece, not to mention everybody else outside Greece, of what happens if you mess with Macedonia, right? Uh, is that probably the main reason why... Uh, nobody chose to reform this. I mean, it, it, you would almost think like, why didn't the Macedonians just be like, oh, okay, we'll have a few troops, something like this, as long as you have your loyalty to us. What would you say about, about that aspect? Why wasn't it reformed? Well, in a way, the Macedonians did adapt the model of Thebes in their military strategy. They also used the cut off the snake strategy in their major battles. Alexander would charge right at the position of the enemy king, and both his big battles against mm -hmm. the Persians were, were decided in that way. And his unit, the companion cavalry, as it was called, the word companion there mm -hmm. it doesn't suggest um, an erotic relationship, but a, an intimate bond with the king. So uh, the king became um, a kind of a cult figure an adored figure and his favor was displayed by 
invitations to dinners and to hunting expeditions and other forms of intimacy. So it wasn't exactly a band of lovers, but it was a band formed on the basis of deep personal loyalty to one individual, to Alexander. And of course, Alexander was kept, uh, was portrayed in uh, beautiful, youthful, godlike images to foster the idea mm -hmm. that he was the Aromanos. He was the beloved of the whole culture. Mm -hmm. So there is a, an influence. And it's interesting to note that Alexander's father, Philip, uh, was in residence at Thebes as a teenager during the glory days of Epaminondas and the sacred band. He observed all this at first hand and then became king some years mm -hmm. later. So it's, it seems to me inevitable that he adapted some of the lessons of Thebes. And, and so, and, and again, here we're seeing yet another culture within this larger region that has its own forms of a sort of male male relationship but did not have the lifelong, so far as we know, did not have the lifelong commitments between men uh, in an erotic sense that Thebes did. Exactly. So what, what's the lasting legacy of all this, of the sacred band? How has it inspired or, or not inspired uh, people across the ages? Uh, how remembered is it? How forgotten is it? Well, I think it's been largely forgotten in the 20th century. I think scholars in my field have been embarrassed to talk about it or mm. averse to talking about it, but it, it has gotten a certain attention. And especially in the 19th century in England, mm -hmm. and my book includes four vignettes or slices of the 19th century British history in which the idea of male eros was being rediscovered or being acknowledged publicly for the first time. And largely that came about as a result of readings of the Greek classics, including the stories of the sacred band. Mm -hmm. So you have um, Benjamin Jowett, who was a prominent humanist teacher at Oxford, and his student, uh, John Addington Simmons, and Oscar Wilde, and other members of the British elite who were inspired by these texts and, and published accounts of how much they were inspired by them. And that led to um, the British Iranian movement and the first public acknowledgement of, of male homosexuality. Yeah, and they even formed around it uh the order of Karanea. That's right. Yes. Um, yeah. So actually taking the name of their organization, which I have read as being among the first uh, gay rights organizations in Europe, the order of Karanea, taking the name of it for this sacred band, uh, an allusion to the, the battle where they fought to the last man. Yes. And the founder of that order, George Cecil Ives kept a, long and voluminous diary about his life as a gay male in Victorian England and dated the entries, not years from the birth of Christ, but years from the Battle of Karanea. He thought of that as the <laughs> right. start of the new era. Uh, and mm. then, as you say, named the, the order after the battle at which the sacred band fought and died. So very much uh, inspiring, at least to this particular subculture of uh, Victorian era people. Yes. Uh, and I believe uh, Oscar Wilde was an early member of that order. I'm not sure if that's confirmed historically, but that's what I've read. Yes, it's hard to know because the membership was kept secret. We know that he was approached and had a long correspondence with George Cecil Lives. And uh, one of his most famous quotations was from a letter to Ives in which he talks about the battlefields of uh, the struggle for gay rights being read with many martyrdoms. That's a phrase that you often see referred to. Uh, mm. That was a letter to the founder of the Order of Karenea. But we don't know whether he was actually a member. Beautiful. Thank you. 
Well, this has been just amazingly interesting, James. Thank you very much uh, for coming on the show and talking to us about this. For our listeners, where can they find your book? And is there anything else that you would like our listeners to know? Well, I would just call attention again to the illustrations, which I'm very um, proud of, the, the drawings from the mass tomb and a composite drawing that some of your listeners may have seen in The New Yorker last month. Uh, in, in April, um, that uh, digital illustrator put together, taking all the individual drawings of the band skeletons and reassembling them so that you can see them in the phalanx formation in which they were buried. The first time this image has ever been available. So um, cool. the book's available in bookstores, I hope, and uh, <laughs> of course online. Um, and uh, it, it appears June 8th. June 8th. All right. You heard it. And uh, we'll be sure to have a link to that New Yorker article that you just mentioned in the show notes on the our website for our podcast here. Well, thank you very much once again, James, for being on the show. It was a blast. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. So there you have it, folks. The men of the sacred band of Thebes were the OG gays in the military. They fought side by side with their lovers to inspire each other on to bravery. And ultimately, they proved that courage not only by trouncing Sparta, but by fighting to the last man against Alexander the Great. The Battle of Chaeronea was the Alamo of ancient Greece and they went down as an inspiring example of self-sacrifice for gays and for all. Now, the takeaway for me is that this notion of forming a crack core specifically around gay male love, as wacky as it may sound to us today, really wasn't so wacky after all. It made perfect sense to the ancient Greeks, and that just demonstrates how differently they thought about sexual preference. Their gays in the military debate had a very different tenor than the one in the modern West today. To the ancient Greeks, the question wasn't, should we allow gays in the military, but rather, could same-sex lovers be the hardest, toughest, bravest fighters of them all? Well, that gives us all something to think about this Pride Month. I hope you learned something today. I certainly did. Be sure to pick up James Rum's new book, The Sacred Band, 300 Theban Lovers Fighting to Save Greek Freedom, available on Amazon and at your local bookstore tomorrow. Folks, if you like what we're doing here on this show, you can support us by subscribing, rating, and reviewing. You can also pledge on Patreon, where $5 a month gets you a portrait drawn in the time period and culture of your choosing. I will draw you brandishing your hoplite spear, boldly braving the battle alongside the soldier next to you. Or whatever you want, I'll make you look awesome, I promise. Just go to www.patreon.com slash btnewberg. That's patreon.com slash b-t-n-e-w-b-e-r-g. That's it for this month, folks. We'll be back next month for the second part of our Viking Gender Benders series. It got pushed out, but it's coming, I swear. Where we will be talking about male witches in Viking Scandinavia. I'll see you next time. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. Podcast theme music mixed from tracks by Kevin McLeod. For additional credits, references, photos, and more, see our website at www.historyofsexpod.com.